Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the ways uh, in the Old Testament, when people had encounters with God, often they would mark those moments by building stone altars. And I think some of other artists like myself, I know, uh, usually mark those moments with pieces of art. And so uh, this is sort of uh, my altar for a moment with God, mm. uh, celebrating the presence of God in very strange places. Mm. So, not to mean that this is a strange place. <laughs> uh, but if we were to say that, it would be a good thing. Well, Amen? Amen. 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 So, uh, let me sort of put in context what you're going to see in here today. Um, one of the most difficult questions I've been asked is, uh, what do you do? It's hard to say, really. Uh, at some point, I adopted the title of professional fool. Uh, most often, this uh, response resulted in a perplexed expression and a long pause. But you see, my experience and work in comedy has shaped how I see the, see the world. It also shapes my experience of faith. One of my heroes is a man named Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I spent many long hours watching and studying Charlie Chaplin films, trying to understand the essence of comedy. The best description I found to describe his work said, and I quote, He has brought down the powerful and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Do you recognize those words? Yes. <coughs> My goodness. I doubt that Mary, the mother of Jesus, ever saw, ever saw a Chaplin film. But she definitely nailed the essential elements of a Chaplin comedy when she proclaimed the Magnificat, because those are her words. I, it also, I might add, is an apt description of the kingdom of God, or what Paul, the apostle, would say, the foolishness of God. And to think, what our culture thinks of as funny and absurd is what should be the norm for the community of faith. So, before addressing the events of the Easter story, let's first look at how we remember stories. Where do they live? Where are they sheltered when they're not being remembered? Have you ever wondered? So allow me to tell you a story to explain stories. A couple of years ago, my wife Marion and I met our adult children in Colorado to spend a week together in Rocky Mountain National Park. At the end of our week, we took my daughter Micah to the Denver airport to catch an early morning flight. Our son Isaac, his flight left later in the afternoon, and we had about a five-hour window to wait before his plane left. Isaac remembered that uh, my father had been stationed at Lowry Air Force Base when I was in elementary school and wanted to see my old neighborhood. Now, although the place had changed a lot <coughs> over 50 years, <coughs> My elementary school, the site of my first athletic conquest, <laughs> the slow bike race, <laughs> was still intact. As we drove past the school and around my old neighborhood, long forgotten stories about my youth and family came rushing back to me. My son's desire to learn more about his father's childhood was rewarded. And I too learned something that I did not know about my own story. This happened when we visited a nearby wildlife refuge. Sarin gas, a poison used in chemical weapons, had been manufactured on this site not five miles from our base housing when I lived there. Easter was having its way. The site was being cleaned up and restored to a wildlife refuge. And so we see Stories inhabit places. Some stories live in relationships, even peripheral ones. I'm artist in residence at uh, Furman University in the Theater Arts Department. Recently, we have had another guest artist working with our students. And it turns out that we both attended the same pool school, the Del Arte School of Physical Comedy. I attended in 1979. She attended in 2006. 
common relationships and experiences generated story after story between the two of us who had never met before. It turns out that shared experiences and relationships are sanctuaries for stories also. Mm -hmm. For example, one story I remember uh, talking with her reminded me of a theater exercise that we did at Del Arte the first year I was there. This exercise I, I contemplated for many years and I'm still I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, let's call it the mother exercise. Imagine, if you will, a, a rehearsal studio about the size. And the rehearsal studio was strewn with every loose object that could be found in the building. There were shoes and socks, backpacks, firewood, books, cups, hats, wine bottles, sandwiches. You sort of get the picture. On the opposite side of the room from the students was an empty garbage can that Carlo, our teacher, had named Mother. There were three narrow footpaths that led to Mother through the littered chaos. Each of us, in turn, was blindfolded, turned in circles, and placed facing Mother at the spot where the three paths to Mother began. The exercise was to walk on one of those paths to Mother without encountering any of the litter along the way. And if your foot touched something, you were stopped, taken back to the beginning of the trail, turned several times, and made to do it again. Need I say, no one in my experience ever reached mother. Mm -hmm. Stories root me to who I am and how I think. So, today, along with Christians all over the world, we are remembering the resurrection story. And we're celebrating the empty tomb. Now, one of the things I noticed in today's scripture, even though Mary had been told numerous times what was to happen, she still did not understand. Mm -hmm. Or she didn't even recognize Jesus when he saw him. As a fool, I began wondering, is there something that we do not understand about the resurrection story? Is there something we're missing? Is there something, is there someone we do not recognize? Mary was intimate with Jesus. We are separated by 2,000 years. What are we missing? So, I want to go back and look at the tomb. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. You sure? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's empty. Mm -hmm. Now, before you pick up your stones, <laughs> Let me propose this possibility. Jesus has revolutionized our understanding of the world and life through his resurrection. But as you all know, it's Sunday, and Tuesday is coming. The reality is that we have been left behind. As much as we would like to illegally immigrate through those pearly gates, it's not our time. Resurrection is not the end of the story as we had hoped, but perhaps a serious new chapter on the ongoing story of love. So, what are we going to do? How are we going to continue? The answers, I think, can be found both in place and relationship. And those stories, I think, reside inside the shadows of the so-called empty tomb. The tomb is where, is the place where our journey stories live. Undistorted, out of reach of our need to rewrite and sanitize the resurrection into small sound bites that don't offend us. I brought a tomb. Here it is. There we look inside. I'm a fool. It's my kind of game. Women. 
There are women in the shadows. There are always women in the shadows. And they are telling us stories of war, fear, suffering, and abuse. Is an unwed teenage mother. Her story tells us of a refugee giving birth in a shelter filled with animals, filth, and maggots. The mother of Jesus. Her story continues to reveal a refugee family fleeing, fleeing violent soldiers at the whims of an insane ruler. In the tomb, the narrative remains true to her story. The farther the story gets from the tomb, the more distorted and romantic we tend to make it. Outside the tomb, we sing, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Or, away in a manger, no grip for our dead. As if that were her biggest problem. Yeah. Well, how about... Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. As they will tonight in Syria, in Somalia, in Egypt, and every other place on the world that's suffering from repression and war. Or we talk about this young woman as the Holy Mother, the Madonna, the Virgin Mary. But never as the peasant, the unwed teenager that she really is. about this woman, Rachel, unconsolable grief, a voice is heard in Rama, loud wailing lamentation, Rachel was weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled, because they are no more, the tomb will not let us forget those things we do not understand. Outside the tomb, it's forgotten. Perhaps an inconvenience, maybe a footnote. Indicting. The stories there expo expose our abusive nature. Here's one woman's story, repeated here and elsewhere throughout the ages. She's been caught, tortured, disregarded, and used. She's guilty of so many things, mostly of being a woman. Should we punish her, Jesus? Yes. But only. If you are not deserving of punishment yourself, he says. And he knows we are. But the tomb is forgiven. Those who wish you harm, they're gone. Resurrection. 
The tomb will not let us forget how it is. Outside the tomb, the tomb, the distortion begins. Those men, that woman, what do you expect? It was Jesus. <laughs> Forgiven anyway. Inside the tomb, we inhabit both parts. We are those men. We are that woman. Too painful. Let's move that story out and away. We really don't want to know. stories. All were early signs of Easter, painful and pleasant. Here's a story about a sightless man, but one who was hardly blind. In this story, he is one of only a handful of people who really recognize Jesus. <sighs> Jesus! Son of David! Have mercy on me! Jesus! Son of David! Have mercy on me! Jesus! Son of David! Have mercy on me! The disciples ask, Who's guilty and responsible for his blindness? Jesus asks, What? you want to me? The sightless say, we want to see. Resurrection. Early signs of Easter. If we only knew how to see. This one, this story here, tells a story of being possessed by addictions, doubts, lust, greed, and malevolence. This one too sees beyond sight. Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you have to do with me? Jesus knowing, but asking anyway, what is your name? Legion comes the reply. And then, signs of Easter appear. Be free of those things that possess you. Told. He is risen. The tomb is empty. Look to the clouds. He is returning. But if the tomb is empty, I am lost. Are we like Mary and the disciples? Are there things that we have missed? Can you see? Look carefully again at the stories. If he is risen, the tomb is no longer a place of death, but the very epicenter of resurrection. It contains the way in which we are to continue to redeem ourselves and our world. 
The tomb roots us to the true context of our faith and every Easter moment that was revealed to us. In the tomb we find the reassurance and the hope that there is no disaster, no act of violence in our present world that is beyond God's ability to bring resurrection. Remember the mother exercise from pool school? You see, I finally think I figured it out. I think it's about the importance of the journey. For without the journey, there is no destination. Each step moves us closer to mother or away from mother. The stories enshrined in the tomb are a record of each of our steps to resurrection. And they maintain our sight even though we cannot see it. Being firmly rooted in the tomb guides us on a continued daily revelation of Easter to our modern world. Go stare up at the clouds if you will. They will be shining brightly. But I hope to live, I hope to live out the resurrection grounded in the place resurrection began. He has risen. Our journey to mother. Amen. 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 Amen.